The Great Depression began in 1929 and led to a banking crisis in Germany in July 1931 when the Danant Bank went under. The Weimar government, headed by conservative leader Brüning, merged it with the Dresdner Bank, which was also in trouble, and basically bailed it out. Brüning also bailed out Fritz Thyssen's United Steelworks by buying 25 million Reichsmarks of stock for 99 million. The government's stake in the United Steelworks ended up being 52%. And there were other bailouts going on at the time, such as the Gleisenberg Affair. But why this matters is because this process of buying company stocks is seen as a nationalization process. And so, when Hitler gets in, and Yalmar Schacht, the head of the Reichsbank, sold the stocks again, this is seen as a privatization process. So the government's stake in Fritz Thyssen's United Steelworks went from 52% to 25%, and the conclusion is that Hitler is a capitalist. And by that logic, conservative leader Brüning would also be a socialist. But logical inconsistencies aside, there's an ever so slight problem with this narrative. The historians pushing this conclusion have failed to notice something that's a little bit important. It's what some of us like to call the Third Reich. You see, while the economy of the Weimar Republic was mostly a market economy, the economy of the Third Reich was different. It was totalitarian. Under the totalitarian state, the Nazi party members marched into the businesses and took them over from within, functionally nationalising everything from the media, the trade unions, and every social club, including the canary breeders and the stamp collectors. Between the 30th of January and the 14th of July 1933, the Nazis had coordinated all social institutions, apart from the churches and the army, into a vast and still inchoate structure run by themselves. They had purged huge swathes of culture and the arts, the universities and the education system, and almost every other area of German society of everyone who was opposed to them. And so, the selling of stocks was irrelevant. Selling stocks does not mean that the state had less ownership or control of the businesses because the party itself was running them. The state functionally ran the businesses even if they didn't have a majority of stocks in a company. And so, these historians pushing the narrative that Hitler privatised the industries are completely misleading you and themselves. And this leads to some really hilarious conclusions on the part of these historians, which would be funny if it was any other subject, but is really concerning due to the political and economic ramifications this distortion of history is having on the world we live in. People conclude that because Hitler was bad, and he was supposedly a free market guy, therefore free markets are bad, and so they're ironically calling for the exact same policies Hitler himself implemented, which they don't believe he did. Let's take an example. One of the factories in IG Farben was called Hürscht, which was a dye works in Frankfurt. Frankfurt was anything but a Nazi stronghold, and Hürscht itself was even worse. In November 1929, only 5.4% of the people in Hürscht voted for the NSDAP, compared to 16.3% for the Communists. Most of IG Farben's management were also in favour of the DDP, the Liberals, not the Nazis or the Communists. And prior to the seizure of power, only one Nazi, Wilhelm Rudolf Mann, was on the board of directors for IG Farben. After the seizure of power, in mid-June 1933, the National Socialist Workers' Cell Organization, the NSBO, synchronized, gleichschaltungd, the industries, including Hirscht. At the end of July 1933, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the NSBO, and the State Trade Union, the German Labour Front, the DAF, said there should be no hirings or firings without consulting the members of the works councils, that all punishments on National Socialists should be removed, and that all the Communists should be dismissed from their jobs. And at first, Hirsch tried to resist these attempts at control, but when the laws started to get passed, they had no choice but to give in. Legally, the relationship between works management and workforce was regulated by the Gesetz zur Ordnung der Nationalen Arbeit, AOG, Law on the Organisation of National Labour, which was passed on January 20th, 1934, and the Factory Code of Rules prescribed therein. 
According to the law on the Organization of National Labor passed on January 20th, 1934, all persons employed in a company or plant became a Betriebsgemeinschaft or plant community. The head of the company or plant was now referred to as the Betriebsführer or plant leader, and the workforce now constituted a Gefolgschaft, which translates approximately as followers. In an attempt to abolish class conflict and bring everyone together into one community, the people's community, the Volksgemeinschaft, the Nazis abolished the idea of employers and employees. Instead, you now had this plant community, Betriebsgemeinschaft, headed by a plant leader, Betriebsführer, and the workers became followers, Gefolgschaft. So, imagine walking into McDonald's and seeing the regular workers there, but behind them you now have these guys in Nazi police-style uniforms who are no longer interested in making profit, but are there to enhance the national and social spirit of the community. That's what it would have been like in every major business and industry in the Third Reich. The preamble of the Factory Code stated that the leaders and followers of these plants now constituted a factory community sharing a common destiny who were to work together in faithful comradeship and mutual trust for the good of the factory, for Germany and its economy, and according to the principle of common weal before private gain. Every employee should carry out his allotted tasks conscientiously and in a disciplined manner, showing a joyful commitment to the National Socialist State and its Führer, as well as unwavering loyalty towards the plant community, the Volksgemeinschaft National Community, and the German Fatherland. The following paragraphs then outline the regulations concerning hiring, working hours, work habits, prevention of accidents, wages, vacation, infringement of the factory code, and generalities. Even though it's not a perfect account, I do recommend the book Inside IG Farben by Lindener as a good read for everything that was going on in Hirscht during the Third Reich. Unlike most sources on the Nazi economy, the author gives real depth and gives you the details. It's not just some broad, abstract you know, policy or something, but he gives you the names of the people involved and the, all the infighting and the backstabbing going on. But overall, the sources are clear. The party took over the industries. As I said, only one Nazi, Wilhelm Rudolf Mann, was on the board of directors for IG Farben prior to 1933. Well, after the seizure of power, every single member of the executive branches of IG Farben became members of the Nazi party, except for the one who's a Swiss national and therefore exempt. And there are multiple sources showing that heavy social regulations were imposed on every industry. The Reichskommissar for Prices, Josef Wagner, was trying to set all the prices in the economy throughout the Reich. In addition to the price controls, you know, goods were centrally distributed. That's right. Materials could only be bought with certificates which were obtained from one of the various central planning boards which distributed those materials. There were boards for coal, textiles, timber, batteries, paper and steel, amongst many others. Millions of questionnaires are sent out in order to get a true picture of demand, stocks, etc. Questionnaires and statistical reports of thousands of firms are collected and catalogued. A vast number of office workers labours over them in order to calculate normal requirements, the volume of demand, and all the figures necessary for getting a picture of the market situation. And if the business leaders refused to cooperate with the demands of the state, the businesses were taken off them. Professor Juncker of the Juncker's Airplane Factory was thrown out of his own business. And even the sources that say that there was privatisation going on, like bells against the mainstream, have to admit that those businesses that were privatised had their stocks and shares sold to organisations of the Nazi party. The irony of this is that the Nazi party is the state, and yet Bell calls it a private sector organisation. No, it's not. And this is an example of one of the hilarious conclusions that these historians are coming to. So, when we look at Fritz Thyssen's United Steelworks, yes, the Weimar government bought a 52% share in the business. And yes, Nazi Reichsbank president Jalmar Schacht sold a lot of those shares, reducing the government's stake to 25%. But who remained in charge of the United Steelworks? Fritz Thyssen, who was a Nazi party member and one of the only two leading industrialists to support Hitler prior to the seizure of power. The other was Emil Kurdoff, 
who left the party in 1927, and so it doesn't really count. And the Betribes Gemeinschaft was still implemented. The National Socialist Party organizations were still running the business and the rest of the economy. And so this is why Fritz Thyssen himself fled the country, because he wasn't really running his own business. The state was. The nationalization of the large Thyssen concern was, in fact, part of a wider process in which Goering was getting industry in line to serve the interests of autarky and rearmament. Heavy industrialists in firms such as the United Steelworks, backed behind the scenes by Yalmar Schacht while he was still in office, objected furiously to this increase in state ownership and control, and to state-subsidized competition with their own enterprises. They began intriguing against the four-year plan and talking about ways of getting state controls reduced. Goering had their secret meetings bugged and their telephone conversations tapped and even summoned the two leading conspirators to his office to play back recordings of their conversations. Faced with such pressure and the more than implicit threat of arrest and consignment to a concentration camp, the industrialists, intimidated, disillusioned and divided, caved in. Fritz Thyssen, one of the major industrialists to give initial support to Hitler after the seizure of power, on the assumption that the Nazis would create a paternalistic corporate state, finally broke with Nazism and fled from Germany. His substantial holdings in the Stalverein were taken over compulsory by the state. Soon, Germany will not be any different from Bolshevik Russia. The heads of enterprises who do not fulfill the conditions which the plan prescribes will be accused of treason against the German people and shot. And Fritz Thyssen eventually ended up in a concentration camp. So, the one industrialist who actually supported the National Socialists prior to the seizure of power lost the ability to control his firm, came under increasing pressure from the state, fled, had his firm nationalised into the state, and was placed in a concentration camp. Yet, what does Bell, in Against the Mainstream, conclude about this? The state did not retain ownership in United Steelworks after this privatisation operation was completed. The only way Bell could possibly come to this conclusion is by ignoring the Third Reich itself. The Third Reich did not have a market economy. It was totalitarian. And so the buying and selling of stocks is completely irrelevant. It is not an indicator of whether the state was or was not in control. The state was in complete control, despite the fact that they sold the stocks of certain businesses. And I really want to hammer home just how silly this privatization narrative really is. Bell proceeds to name all the firms that were supposedly privatized because of the selling of stocks and shares. One of these firms he names was the Deutsche Bank. The government was eager to raise money from privatization, as pointed out in The Economist and The Banker. Then, state ownership in the large commercial banks was sold in successive operations. Deutsche Bank was reprivatized in several operations, effectively implemented in 1935-37. For starters, The Economist magazine is not a source we should be relying upon for accurate information. Turns out, Fabian socialist journalists in a completely different country with zero knowledge of what was actually going on inside Germany are not the fantastically reliable source that Bell thinks they are. But interestingly, one of my critics told me that if I just read this book on the Deutsche Bank, then I would have all the proof that I need to see that this really was privatization. Huh, okay. Let's have a read then, shall we? Hitler's new regime aimed at complete control of economic as well as social, political and cultural activities. In economics, it interpreted the depression as evidence of the failure of the private market economy and of the necessity of state intervention. The National Socialist New Order inherited from the depression governments a network of controls and proceeded to make it even more extensive. In 1934, a system of managed trade was inaugurated, as well as the allocation of raw materials and the restriction of dividend payments. And after 1936 came a far-reaching regulation of prices. So this is yet another source saying that there were price controls, more regulations, a system of managed trade, and a restriction on private capital. And no, I have no idea why a critic would recommend to me this source in particular as proof that Hitler wasn't a socialist. It completely undermines the privatization narrative. 
but it could be because this author is as confused as Bell is and makes contradictory statements. So perhaps the critic just ignored the evidence and the contradictions and only read the bits where the author came to silly conclusions. For example, just after making it clear that the Nazis controlled everything, the author then says, With the exception of the racially motivated attack on Jewish possessions, the fundamental principle of private ownership was left untouched. The laws defining what ownership involved, the property rights, however, were utterly transformed. What do you mean by this? Property rights, which define private ownership rights, were utterly transformed, yet you contradict yourself by saying the fundamental principle of private ownership was left untouched. Well, it wasn't because you just said the property rights were utterly transformed. So which is it? Honestly, I cannot believe you managed to write this without seeing how it is a blatantly obvious contradiction. Like, how on earth did you write these two sentences together? This is a great example of what I'm trying to get across here. The historians are coming to hilariously contradictory conclusions because their narrative is based on a fundamental flaw. This Keynesian Cambridge historian cannot bring himself to admit that the Third Reich was not capitalist, so he concludes that private ownership existed even though he knows full well that property rights were abolished. Private property rights, as enshrined in Articles 115 and 153 of the Weimar Constitution, were abolished in the Reichstag Fire Decree of 1933. Many historians ignore this part of the Reichstag Fire Decree simply because they can't explain it, or think it's irrelevant, or they reject reality in favour of contradictions. The Nazis viewed private property as conditional on its use, not as a fundamental right. If the property was not being used to further Nazi goals, it could be nationalised. But if you are pushing this false narrative of privatisation, this presents a problem when you realise that private property rights in the Third Reich were no longer there. So Bell and James, the author of the Deutsche Bank book, end up in this contradictory mess where they say private property rights were left untouched, but utterly transformed at the same time. Or that privatisation was occurring, but the bias of these industries were organisations of the Nazi party, which obviously means it wasn't privatisation at all. And to show this off, let's continue by reading what James writes. Germany remained a private economy, but without the guidance of those signals usually associated with the operation of a market. Freely determined, not administered prices, interest rates and exchange quotations. It was an economy without a market mechanism, which was supposed to behave as its new masters wished. Prices are essential to the market. Their suppression and distortion leads to a command economy. So it was a command economy. There was no private market. It was all state control, yet somehow it was private. Apparently, opening up a dictionary and reading the definition of the word private is beyond the ability of these Keynesian economists. And the book is full of this contradictory nonsense. I could literally be here for hours pointing out the discrepancies. But the good news is that if you overcome the contradictions and integrate the evidence he presents into the other sources, it actually supports the idea that the Third Reich nationalised the industries in all but name. According to the Marxists and the Keynesians, Hitler's regime is meant to be capitalist. So you'd think that the big Berlin banks and the Deutsche Bank would see profits rise through the roof. But they did not. Profits collapsed between 1934 and 1935, becoming a fraction of what they were in 1933 or in the 1920s. This undermines James' own narrative that the Nazis didn't really want to take over the banking industry. I mean, we know they did because Schacht himself tells us they did. We worked and ruled with incredible elan. We really ruled. For the bureaucrats of the ministry, the contrast to the Weimar Republic was stark. Party chatter in the Reichstag was no longer heard. The language of the bureaucracy was rid of the paralysing formula. Technically right, but politically impossible. Continuing with the contradictions, James says that the National Socialists held a bank inquiry in September 1933, and that their aim was to reform the banking system. 
But unwilling to admit the true nature of the National Socialist regime, he then says this. Wilhelm Kepler, on whom Hitler had bestowed the grandiose but ultimately meaningless title of Commissar of Economic Issues, repeated during the inquiry sessions a long litany of familiar complaints about banks and their position. Well, no, Kepler was an important figure in the Third Reich, who ended up creating a circle of friends, which would end up becoming Himmler's circle of friends. At this time, he was in charge of all party organisations involved with the economy. And Kepler was leading a bank inquiry at this time, proving that he was the right commissar for economic affairs. But because James is trying to say that the National Socialists weren't socialists, and because he's concentrating on the economics rather than the actual history of the Third Reich, he probably doesn't know who Kepler is. So James declares without proof that the title was meaningless, even though it isn't. He's letting his Keynesian bias mislead him to faulty conclusions. He then says Kepler sets out to help the small and medium-sized businesses, calling for a decentralization of decision-making and a reduction in interest rates. He's implying to the reader that the National Socialists were against the centralization or nationalization of the banks. Unfortunately, once again, this is a misinterpretation. The big banks are capitalism, right? So being against the banks is being against capitalism. Thus, a socialist doesn't want a banking cartel, unless you're Karl Marx, and is forcing them to spread their wealth across the economy in a more egalitarian way to help the German community, the Volksgemeinschaft. So while they have nationalized the banks, as in the dictating what they should and shouldn't do, they are in the process of decentralizing them. But it would be wrong to call this denationalization or privatization, which is what James is implying. Now, because Yalmar Schacht, the head of the Reichsbank, the central bank, supported these banks, the Nazis were compelled to back down from this inquiry, instead opting to put in regulations on the 5th of December 1934 under the Reich Credit Law, which James also says wasn't very effective, because if they were effective, that would undermine the narrative he's trying to present. Basically, his argument is that the Nazis didn't really want to take over the banks. But not only is this a gross misunderstanding of who Yalmar Schacht was, what he was trying to achieve, and why he was scheming against the Nazi party whilst trying to implement Hitler's plans, but it is also undermined by the evidence James himself presents. If the regulations weren't effective, why did profits collapse for the Deutsche Bank after the right credit law. Also, if Hitler's regime was capitalist, why was profit-driven capitalism not doing so well under his regime? You'd think profits would soar under a profit-motive capitalist government, and yet the exact opposite is what happened. And then he says that a new law was introduced on the 4th of December 1934 called the Dividend and Bond Law. This imposed a ceiling on company dividends, making ownership and issuing of equities less attractive. So the state was dictating to the businesses what they could and couldn't do, again undermining the idea that this was capitalism. Share issues throughout the 1930s remained at levels below a quarter of that of the latter 1920s, and even below the volume of the crisis year 1931. Only in one year, 1938, was there an apparent burst of new issues, but it was provoked by the activities of semi-state companies, not genuinely private corporations. The Reichsworker Hermann Goering and the hydration works of Pulitz. Apart from this brief spurt of activity, the market for new share issues stagnated. First off, capitalism was clearly on the demise, not on the rise, undermining James's own narrative, but secondly, the word Reichswerker literally means state work. Reichswerker Hermann Goering was a state-owned and run corporation set up to implement the National Socialist State's four-year plan. This was a national, state-run enterprise. But apparently, according to James, it's not a national firm, it's a semi-state company. Yet, yeah, you cannot make this up. It's an absolute joke. 
Then he has an entire section on the supposed reprivatization of the banks. Regulating banking appeared to the regime as a safer and more economically sound alternative to demands from some of the party radicals for direct control of finance through socialization. In fact, banks were allowed to reprioritize themselves as their positions recovered from depression losses and to buy out the state participations built up in the aftermath of the 1931 banking crisis. In 1936, the Deutsche Bank bought back the remaining shares from the Reichsbank's gold discount bank subsidiary and resold them to its private customers. Right, but again, this is just a way for Schack to raise money for Hitler's rearmament policies. Whether the Reichsbank had shares in a bank or not is irrelevant since they were still in direct control over them, as this author says in the very next sentence. The increased activity of the state worried both the bank and its customers. Why? If there was this massive privatization effort going on, why would there be increased activity from the state? That's a huge contradiction. And it's hilarious just how many times these authors will write one thing in one sentence, then the complete opposite thing in the next sentence, which completely undermines the previous sentence. I would laugh at their gibberish. But because it's, it's a distortion of history, and because the Marxists are using books like James's to reinforce their own ideology, while many other people are being completely misled, surprisingly, I'm not in the mood to laugh. In 1936 and 1937, many companies experienced acute shortages in the supply of raw materials and needed to limit their output in consequence. Later, the criticism of the planned economy became even more explicit. The businessman needs more room for manoeuvre, otherwise he will become merely an employee. We entered the war with a much less elastic economy than in 1914, and the effects are visible everywhere. On the one hand, we have a command economy. On the other, we have the historians concluding that there was a massive privatisation effort going on, based purely on the selling of state stocks and shares of businesses. They are missing the entire totalitarian command economy of the Third Reich because The Economist magazine said selling shares was privatisation. And I think the most ridiculous part of this book on the Deutsche Bank is this. The construction of a historical account of the bank in the Nazi period is particularly difficult because the written material relating to business contracts and overall strategy is much scarcer than that from the Republican and Democratic atmosphere of the 1920s. No! Perhaps the shift to a less written culture was simply a coincidence produced by a move away from the 19th century patterns of behaviour. No, it isn't. But it is more obvious to think of it as emanating from the fear of politics in the dictatorship. The party and the secret police were highly interested in business behaviour. Really? You can't find any sources for the business contracts or overall strategy for the Deutsche Bank in the Nazi era. Isn't that very strange? You can find it for the Weimar Republic, but not for the National Socialist era. That's very odd, isn't it? You think that in a capitalist economy, the bank would have its own policies and contracts, and yet they don't. Gee, why can't we find evidence of capitalism in this capitalist economy? Guys, I can't find any water here. Why can't I find any water? The Economist magazine said that there will be water in this ocean, but I don't see any. Why can't I see any water? Guys, I don't understand. <sighs> I'm sick of this. The mental gymnastics of these historians is insane. The reason you cannot find sources for bank policy or business contracts is because you're not looking in the right place. The National Socialist German Workers Party was running the show, so stop looking for contracts and policy from the businesses themselves and start looking at the Nazi Party's sources. They are the ones running the businesses, not the businesses themselves. My knowledge as a technical expert would not have been sufficient to enable me to struggle along during the past five years, were it not for the fact that our firm has the backing of a prominent party man who comes to our assistance when we need certificates for foreign currency, raw materials, and so on. 
No firm in our trade can exist without such a collaborator. As it is, we have to spend considerable money for judicial advice. It is virtually impossible to function at all without maintaining close relations with one of these lawyers. He can tell you whether or not you have a chance to obtain what you are seeking. You come to depend upon him completely. Formerly, the purchasing agent and the sales manager were among the most important members of a business organization. Today, the emphasis has shifted, and a curious new business aid, a sort of combination go-between and public relations council, is now all important. His job is to maintain good personal relations with officials in the economic ministry, where he is an almost daily caller. He studies all the new regulations and decrees, knows how to interpret them in relation to his particular firm, and is able to guess what may be permitted or forbidden. In other words, it is his business to know how far one can go without getting caught. He also develops special knowledge on how to camouflage private interests so that they appear to be interests of the community or of the state. He knows how urgent the demand of a state department or institution for a certain article may be, and the effect of possible delays in delivery, and therefore whether it will be possible to obtain a higher price or a bonus for speedy delivery. Any firm wishing to remain in business must have such a contact man, who, if possible, should be personally acquainted with some high official. Should a firm fail to find a satisfactory contact man, and otherwise have bad luck in establishing good working relations with officialdom, purest Aryan though its members be, it is likely to be forced out of business. The party was running the show, and that's why the Deutsche Bank had no policy or business contracts. And I'm genuinely baffled by these historians who think that this wasn't the case. Why are they unable to grasp that the Third Reich was totalitarian and therefore had command over the economy and therefore was in control of the businesses. This isn't difficult. Yet, they're doing anything and everything in order to paint Hitler as anything other than a nationalist socialist. And it's hurting my brain to read this nonsense. Honestly, I read a paragraph or two, see all the evidence pointing in one direction, watch them do backflips to contradict it all, and then just come to the exact opposite conclusions of what the evidence suggests, and then I get so frustrated with them that, you know, I just it's just absolutely unbelievable. And I've only scratched the surface here. Let's give one more example. In Bells Against the Mainstream, he states that the Reichsbahn, the state railways, was a state enterprise in the 1930s, which was then privatised by the National Socialists. His evidence for this is, drumroll, The Economist magazine. Because of course it is. And The Economist magazine says some shares in the Reichsbahn were sold, proving that it was privatised. Yet, despite this evidence, Bell has to conclude... The state remained as the most important shareholder in Deutsche Reichsbahn and retained full control of the company. Right, so they didn't actually privatise it. They retained full control of the company, and all they did was sell some shares. But you're going to claim they privatised it anyway, because, you know, pushing that good old ideological agenda is more important than historical accuracy. Mia Zajewski, in the only actual book on the Reichsbahn in English, the other is a picture book and doesn't really count, says this. In fact, the Reichsbahn was coordinated, like Gescheltet, like every other organisation in Germany under the Third Reich. Soon after Hitler became Chancellor, Nazi political organisations were created in the Reichsbahn. The Fachschaft Reichsbahn, professional association in the National Federation of German Officials, Reichsbund der Deutschen Beamten, was formed, and the Fachgruppe Reichsbahn was created in the German Labour Front, Deutsche Arbeitsfront, for the workers. In addition, an emissary for the Hitler Youth was assigned to the RVM. On the 6th of April 1933, the SA broke into the headquarters building of the Reichsbahn and confronted Alfred Bayer, demanding that the entire board of directors be dismissed. They wanted the Jews, the Social Democrats and the Freemasons to be removed, and there were more demands beside this. On the 7th of April 1933, the law for the reconstruction of the professional civil service was passed, allowing the removal of all Jews and non-Aryans from the civil service and the Reichsbahn, 
On the 25th of June 1933, National Socialist Party member Wilhelm Kleiman became Vice General Director of the Reichsbahn and took control of its personnel sector. Some Reichsbahn officials were arrested and many undesirables were removed. By the 4th of July 1933, three members of the board of the Reichsbahn had been removed and replaced by a businessman, a banker and a mayor, all of which were members of the Nazi party. By September 1934, more than one third of the people in the Reichsbahn's offices were Nazis. In May 1933, the unions of the Reichsbahn's workers were shut down and replaced with organisations controlled by the German labour front. The works councils were reformed and their democratic socialist members replaced by people who were either members of the Nazi party or were sympathetic to it. On the 10th of April 1934, new works councils for Trauenstraite were imposed on the Reichsbahn's workers. They were intended to infuse the railway with the party's leadership principle and the feeling of unreserved loyalty that the workers were supposed to have for their employer. The Reichsbahn was officially nationalised in 1937, but this just rubber-stamped what had already happened earlier in 1933 and 1934. And in addition to a bunch of other state interventions, the National Socialists removed the price system from the railways in favour of what they described as social considerations, which is what we saw earlier with Hirscht. And this is just a snippet of the information coming from Mia Zajewski's book, which I highly recommend. It should be obvious to you why you don't get anything like this level of detail from Bell or any of these other Keynesian historians pushing this idea that the industries, banks and Reichsbahn were privatised. But in case it's not obvious, the reason why is because the evidence doesn't support what they're saying, so their narratives have to remain in the abstract. They cannot make anything they're saying concrete because as soon as they do, their narratives come apart. If they told you that the Nazis were inside the businesses and running them, the idea that Hitler privatised the industries wouldn't work, so they simply ignore it. Thus, they dismiss the entire totalitarian nature of the Third Reich. Again, if it wasn't for the serious nature of the subject, this would be laughable. But the consequence of their distortion is that the generations of teachers, students and casual readers of history fall for what is essentially a Marxist or Fabian socialist ideology. Keynes was a Fabian. And we all become poorer as a result. So, to conclude, in a normal market economy, the state could buy out the stocks of a company as a way to claim ownership of a firm or bail out a failing business. We call this process nationalisation. And selling those stocks at a later date could indicate that the state is no longer in ownership of the business. We call that process privatisation. But that's in a normal market economy. Hitler's Third Reich wasn't a market economy. Under the same totalitarian state which sent the Nazi party members into the businesses and took them over from within, functionally nationalising everything, buying and selling stocks was not an indication of state ownership or control. The state functionally ran the businesses, even if they didn't have a majority of shares in the company. And so, these historians pushing the narrative that Hitler privatised the industries are completely misleading themselves and their readers. And all I hope is that the historical community wakes up and moves away from that contradictory nonsense. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.